So hi, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, we're going to be continuing our lecture series on um, neurodevelopmental neuropathology, um, talking about some uh, important malformations. And uh, this particular, uh, I guess, pair of uh, uh, lectures um, will be focusing on posterior fossa malformations. And this specific lecture, we'll be talking about um, two important ones, Chiari and Dandy Walker malformation. Uh, so um, yeah, um, let's let's dive into this topic. Um, of course, these are for educational purposes. These lectures that I develop are mostly geared towards uh, neuropathology trainees to help them understand many of the uh, complex topics and um, ways that I use to remember them. Uh, these are by no means for uh, diagnostic purposes, but strictly for educational um, uh, purposes. And um, uh, if you have one of these disorders, um, of course, uh, uh, there is no better source than your uh, primary uh, physician. So um, as I mentioned, this will be part of a two-set um, series on posterior, posterior fossa malformations. Uh, malformations affecting the back part of your brain, of the cerebellum. And um, today we're going to be talking about Chiari malformations and Dandy Walker malformations. Um, and in another lecture, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Joubert and um, uh, heterotopias and dysplasias of the cerebellum. So um, if you want to uh, follow along in the text, most of the pictures that I'll show today um, were extracted directly from um, these two books. They're the same book, actually, just different editions. Um, I had the original one when I was a, um, a pathology resident, but they've subsequently updated it to um, uh, the second edition um, uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I recommend both. Uh, with every new edition, some information has to come out for new information to come in. And so... Um, reading the same topic in different editions gives you a slightly different uh, perspectives and insights into these diseases. So let's begin with Chiari malformation. Uh, what is it? Um, this is a hindbrain deformity associated with cerebellar herniation and hydrocephalus. This is the definition, as you'll see, that kind of unifies the different types of Chiari malformations um, because there are a, a quite a number of them uh, in this um, uh, in this constellation of diseases. So Chiari 1, um, this is when you have um, the uh, herniation of the cerebellar tonsils into the spinal canal, more specifically into the upper uh, cervical canal. And this uh, MRI uh, kind of just shows what that looks like uh, with the top image showing uh, the yellow line of where uh, the um, frame, frame and magnum, which uh, connects the uh, the brain to the spinal cord and the brain stem to the spinal cord uh, opens. And you can see that in a normal individual, the uh, cerebellum lies above that line. Whereas in a Chiari malformation, there is herniation of that uh, of the tonsil uh, below that uh, imaginary line. Um, and um, uh, it's important to note that this is uh, an absence of another um, uh, lesion in the supratentorial region. So there are cases that may cause herniation, whether it be due to a, a bleed, um, a tumor, or other kind of uh, mass um, space occupying lesions. Um, this is not the, this is not a Chiari one malformation. Chiari one malformation is a neurodevelopmental uh, disease, or at least it's thought to be. Um, that, that that where the herniation happens in absence of any kind of uh, uh, space occupying mass. Um, interestingly, the, um, uh, the the symptomatology of Chiari's uh, is quite um, uh, variable. Many patients are asymptomatic. Other patients have a um, a different spectrum of symptoms depending on the severity of the herniation. And other um, aspects such as uh, hydrocephalus and what, what we'll see a searing formation in the spinal cord. Um, uh, but because there are so many asymptomatic uh, people, it's hard to know exactly what the true incidence and prevalence of, of, of this disorder is in the general population. It does cause some scoliosis. So um, in patients that have scoliosis already, there is a higher prevalence of, of, of Chiari-1 malformations in these patients. 
Now, um, as I mentioned, there is a number of Chiari uh, malformations. Um, another one that uh, is important to know is Chiari 2. And in this one, you have a more severe displacement of the uh, cerebellar vermis into that upper cervical canal and additional malformations such as a herniation of the um, uh, of the brainstem, uh, kinking of the brainstem, uh, herniation of the fourth ventricle, uh, so much more pronounced herniation. The reason why it is um, uh, categorically different is because it is um, almost invariably associated with a um, myelomeningocele. And so um, the, there is distinct uh, pathophysiological differences uh, in Chiari and Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 that are important to, to note. Um, again, uh, if you're writing an exam, um, this is the key thing that you need to highlight is that your knowledge that uh, uh, Chiari 2 uh, occurs in a large proportion of myelomeningoceles. And it is almost impossible um, um, to um, break this association, at least in the uh, books that I have read. Um, um, the, the two diseases uh, uh, have to go together in the, in the large majority of cases. Um Chiari 3, again, is a categorically different disease. This is when the herniation of the cerebellum uh, is not into the uh, cervical cord, but uh, instead uh, through an occipital encephalocele. Um, and this is distinct from the encephaloceles that we, did talk, we talked about in the um, uh, neural tube defect lecture, um, with the distinction here being that it's the cerebellum that is the primary tissue that's being herniated through the, um, uh, the bony defect. These are extremely rare. Um, and uh, um, yes, I mean, that, that's where we'll leave it at that. Um, there was uh, the original um, uh, Dr. Chiari who uh, characterized these had uh, four. His fourth one was when there was an absence of a cerebellum. Um, this was uh, kind of later uh, found out to be um, likely due to a secondary destruction of the cerebellum rather than actual uh, developmental defect. So it's um, this particular one has fallen out of favor and is no longer used, but uh, I, I put it here for historical purposes. Now, interestingly, you may hear um, variants such as Arnold Chiari that usually is in reference to um, Chiari type two, but for a number of um, uh, kind of... Uh, um, uh, reasons that are beyond the scope of this lecture, um, the um, uh, and, and people that other other people that have contributed to um, the, the the characterization of these diseases, that term has fallen out of favor. You may see it in some textbooks, uh, but uh, now the community has uh, kind of just favored calling um, uh, uh, Chiari two Chiari two. I'll leave it at that. Um, so we mentioned uh, Chiari four likely rather a secondary destruction of the cerebellum rather than a true anomaly. Uh, it's no longer used. Uh, and it's important to note that um, if you read new textbooks, there's been some um, variants that have been proposed, uh, again, due to the spectrum um, that can occur in between these uh, uh, Chiari uh, designations. For example, there's a Chiari zero, uh, where you have cerebellar cr crowding without herniation but because you have a syrinx, which is a collection of uh, CSF in the spinal cord, which is such a prominent feature of the um, symptomatology of this disorder, um, some people will call that um, uh, a Chiari zero. There's also a Chiari 1.5. Um, again, here, uh, perhaps the um, herniation is much more severe. Um, and so it's probably more than a Chiari um, uh, type one. You have that brainstem herniation. That's um, a feature of um, Chiari two, but because Chiari two is really uh, reserved for patients with myelomeningocele,s uh, Chiari one point five can solve that problem uh, when you have a very severe herniation that involves the brainstem in a patient that may not have a myelomeningocele. Um, so just some things to keep in mind. There are some other ones like a Chiari 5 that have been proposed, but um, 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 these are the original ones that uh, um, Chiari himself um, uh, described. So um, here's another MRI. We'll talk about the embryology. Um, 
this should immediately uh, um, be kind of a um, 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 kind of a uh, an easy recognition. You have an MRI um, pointing uh, at uh, it's kind of blurry, but it's pointing at a herniation of the cerebellum into that upper cervical canal, and then you have a defect that looks like a a, a neural tube defect in the lum lumbar sacral area. This has to be a Chiari type two. Uh, because of that association that we mentioned between um, Chiari type 1 and uh, the myelomeningocele. Uh, sorry, Chiari type 2 and the myelomeningocele. So embryologically, um, again, it's considered a herniation syndrome, um, originally considered herniation syndrome, now considered a primary malformation in which the cerebellar tonsils develop low during in utero life. Um, why that why that is, it's unclear. Perhaps there is a defect in how the posterior fossa develops. It may develop to be too small to accommodate the cerebellar growth, and thus it is forced to grow uh, downward. Um, but again, the exact pathophysiological reasons for this um, uh, development of a low-lying uh, cerebellar tonsil is unclear. Um, so Chiari 2. This is very highly debated and contested. Um, multiple theories exist. Uh, the two main ones that you will hear, we talked about one um, in the original neural tube defect um, lecture. Uh, perhaps there's some tethering at the lumbosacral area because of the um, neural tube defect that doesn't allow you to create this kind of free floating spinal cord that's attached to the bottom of the lumbosacral uh, skin area, so there could be some pulling of the of the cord, and thus um, a pulling of the cerebellum and the brainstem through the upper cervical canal. Um, but um, um, th there is some issues with that theory uh, that um, um, that people um, are not happy with. Um, so another theory that has been proposed is uh, what's called a CSF hydrodynamic theory where the a defect in the lumbosacral area leads to loss of cerebrospinal fluid um, uh, below the, um, the cerebellum. And thus there is an unequal pressure with uh, a pressure above uh, due to the hydrocephalus. And, um, or I guess before the hydrocephalus, there's some pressure above and inadequate pressure below to balance out the pressure. And thus there is a, a downward push that will lead to the herniation and subsequent hydrocephalus formation. Um, so uh, interestingly, when you fix the myelomeningocele, um, the um, the Chiari 2 that usually develops after the myelomeningocele um, is uh, has um, is much improved, and so does the hydro the hydrocephalus improves. So there is some um, uh, momentum with this theory, uh, but again. Um, um, there are multiple theories and uh, multiple issues with um, each theory uh, to kind of fully explain the spectrum of disease. So um, still lots to uncover uh, of why these uh, uh, um, malformations occur. Uh, Chiari 3, as we said, is just a special case of an encephalocele. So it's considered to be a primary defect of mesodermal development. And um, while there are some associations with um, some uh, syndromes, um, there's really no kind of clear genetic basis established for many of these um, uh, disorders. So clinical features, um, basically um, you can have almost any neurological feature under the sun, depending on how severe that uh, herniation is, how severe the hydrocephalus is and how large the syrinx is. Um, Usually, uh, they become uh, symptomatic around uh, the teenage years to adult life. And the most common presenting symptom of uh, Chiari 1 is neck pain, headache, um, which is usually worse uh, with uh, kind of Valsalva type of um, actions, um, bending over, coughing, sneezing, um, rising quickly um, uh, due to the kind of... Uh, uh, pressure that's uh, harder to equilibrate uh, during these um, high intensity situations. Um, but um, um, symptoms can also be 
largely attributed to the um, the, the hydrocephalus. Um, interestingly, a lot of the symptoms are also due to the syrinx below um, that's formed in the spinal cord, uh, usually around the C4 to C6 area, but the symptoms will vary depending on where uh, it occurs. And the, the classic one that you may uh, see on an exam is this kind of cape-like distribution. Um, uh, so here in this, uh, you can see here the herniation in this MRI image, and then you have this, this kind of fluid uh, cyst formation in the spinal cord. This usually occurs in the C4, C6 uh, area uh, around um, the arms, and um, um, the, uh, the fluid will disrupt some of the spinal cord fiber tracts, and that's where a lot of the symptomatology will occur. That may that may cause scoliosis, but it also causes this uh, this classic cape-like distribution where you lose um, uh, sensory information, particularly in the uh, pain and temperature um, uh, spinal thalamic tracts, uh, because as you can see, these cross at the level of entry, and so if you have a big fluid cyst uh, space around the uh, central canal. These are going to uh, disrupt these tracts um, and lead to um, um, a defects, either unilateral or con or bilateral um, uh, of pain and temperature in those areas. So when they occur in that common C4 to 6 uh, uh, area, it will interfere with the pain and temperature uh, of the shoulders, um, the chest, and the, uh, the arms. Um, it could, of course, be large enough that it makes its way to the dorsal columns, and then you'll have some um, additional proprioceptive defects, but usually uh, it, it, um, um, it's much more far away from that and thus um, is limited usually to pain and temperature uh, defects. In younger children, you can have the syrinx creep up into, these, um, into the brainstem. Um, in that case, it's called syringobulbia, um, just a, kind of another variant of the same terminology. Uh, and because of the uh, important centers there for sleep and breathing, uh, eye movement, um, you may also have um, some more uh, significant symptoms, uh, especially in younger children. Carry two, um, uh, while the kind of um, uh, the the herniation and the um, um, uh, the involvement of the of the brainstem uh, are much more severe than Carry one. Usually the symptoms are overshadowed by the um, um, myelomeningocele and the hydrocephalus that forms uh, with um, the actual Chiari defects leading to, again, abnormal breathing and swallowing and dysphagia and apnea uh, because of the involvement of the brainstem and the herniation. Um, uh, Chiari 3 associated with a poor prognosis with babies living days to weeks uh, post uh, delivery. Um, not really associated with any syndromes. Um, it's sporadic and extremely rare. So again, for um, family planning, what that terminology usually means is that uh, if, uh, if the parents were to have another baby, um, from what we understand, uh, the chances of this reoccurring um, would be fairly low or lower than um, a disorder where there was a kind of an autosomal recessive or dominant um, um, uh, uh, kind of um, inheritance pattern. So most of these are diagnosed by imaging, as we saw. Um, usually there's a cutoff of how much herniation you need um, down the frame and magnum to be diagnosed. Um, uh, the, tr the tricky part here is that this changes with uh, age. It's about six millimeters, uh, five to six millimeters um, uh, before the age of 10. Uh, but as the brain and, and, and posterior fossa grow um, uh, in, in, as you age, um, this number becomes lower. Um, so um, um, very difficult uh, to, to provide a, a specific number um, that, that uh, is, is uh, meaningful in everyone. And of course, the larger that distance is, uh, that correlates more with actually uh, uh, clinical significant symptoms. Um, also, as we see on the right-hand side, uh, the other thing you want to see on the imaging is the syrinx, which is also visible. 
and depending on the size and location, you'll also be able to attribute the specific patient symptoms to that specific defect. Um, and again, the size of the syrinx, the size of the herniation is what um, will help you correlate to the uh, symptoms. Um, again, many are asymptomatic um, and will be just captured incidentally on imaging. Um, so um, um, uh, if someone does not have symptoms, it doesn't um, preclude a diagnosis of QRE1. Some of the, some of the uh, differentials you want to consider, whether it be on um, radiology or clinical, um, uh, where QRE1 may mimic other diseases is MS, um, spinal mu muscular atrophy, ALS, uh, disc disease. Sometimes that syrinx uh, can... Um, uh, creep its way into the uh, anterior horns and cause some motor defects. So um, important to know uh, the this that this can mimic other um, um, important neurological disorders. So on pathology, uh, as we see here, pretty self-explanatory. You see uh, tonsils extending over the cervical cord. Um, usually. Um, uh, you want to see at least a centimeter on um, at, at the autopsy to um, to be certain, um, and um, and that tissue not only is uh, herniating but uh, is sclerotic and firm uh, because of the kind of um, um, crowding that happens in that area. Forty percent of cases will have syringobulbia, steering, syringomyelia, hydromyelia um, that account for most of the clinical symptoms. So do look for those on uh, pathology as well. These are all the same terms. Hydromyelia, again, is when the uh, the CSF buildup is in the central canal. Syringomyelia is when the CSF buildup is in the spinal cord. And syringobulbia is basically when um, the syrinx uh, includes the, um, um, uh, the brainstem. Microscopy... Um, you get the, the, the herniated tissue is sclerotic and degenerated. Um, and then, and then the the important part, if you do find the syrinx, um, you know there are some mimics. Is this a tumor um, that has a cyst? Is it a uh, some sort of hemorrhage? Is it a metabolic uh, disorder? So um, some important things to consider microscopically when uh, you do find a, a a cavity within the spinal uh, um, canal. Um, carry two again, there is displacement of the vermis over the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. We'll see a nice picture of that in the upcoming slide. Um, but it's more severe and uh, in part of the herniation, you can see the fourth ventricle being pushed down, the pons and the um, um, uh, medulla really getting into that spinal canal. Uh, so much more severe herniation. Um, Usually the posterior fossa and a cerebellum uh, don't develop um, very well. And, and so the posterior fossa is fairly small. You can have aqueductal stenosis, atresia, leading to the hydrocephalus. Uh, but the plugging of the spinal canal uh, could be enough to kind of lead to the hydrocephalus by itself. Um, additional abnormalities, um, really um, um, many different types of uh, things that you can see. Whether is this whether that's because this can occur with specific syndromes, uh, or if it's overcalled, I'm not sure. Again, these are very rare disorders. Um, I, I've never seen one uh, in an autopsy setting. So, uh, but what has been reported: uh, pachygyria, polymicrogyria, uh, paraventricular heterotopia. So, uh, be on the lookout because it could suggest a kind of syndromic uh, variant of. Um, uh, um, or syndromic cause or genetic cause of uh, of this disorder. Um, and again, um, just like CARI-1, hydromyelia, syringomyelia are common. CARI-3, uh, protrusion of the cerebellum through the bony, uh, through a bone defect, usually in the upper cervical vertebrates, um, cerebellum distorted um, and small, dysplasias and uh, degeneration can also be present. Um, and again, hydromyelia and syringomyelia um, are, are, are components of this disease. Here is um, a quite a severe Chiari type 2 showing uh, the, um, 
the cerebellar vermis uh, really herniating uh, really far down and around the spinal cord. It's like not only in the back, but it seems to be wrapping around just due to that um, a lack of space it has in that spinal canal. So um, a very severe example um, uh, in this uh, young fetus. Um, and um, we can see that this develops fairly early on during development. And here is just a, a gross picture uh, of an autopsy um, of a newborn with uh, Chiari 3 with that large uh, herniation of the cerebellum in the cervical lower occipital region um, in a newborn. Okay, so that's really uh, the Chiari malformations, um, uh, very distinct disorders uh, grouped together by this um, uh, herniation phenomenon of the cerebellum. Um, uh, so uh, hopefully that gives you a good kind of um, framework of how to think of these disorders. Um, but uh, nonetheless, to say, even though they have a similar name, as we saw, they're categorically different disorders. Now we're going to talk about Dandy Walker malformations. This also exists as uh, a number of uh, disorders um, in some classification schemes, uh, Dandy Walker variants or complex um, importantly here is um, whether these are continuum or different disorders is much more contested. Um, so um, just keep that in mind that um, while we will, I will be showing them as a continuum because I think it helps um, you to conceptualize how different related disorders may be um, um, organized in your, in your, in your, in your mind. Um, whether these are similar, uh, that uh, similar disorders on a spectrum or distinct disorders uh, is a highly debated topic. So um, the, um, the stereotypical Dandy Walker malformation, uh, this is a, um, a spectrum of disease, which includes cystic dilatation of the fourth ventricle. Um, there is hypoplasia of the cerebellar vermis, and there is enlargement of the posterior fossa. Um, and because of this, um, you get some other secondary things like elevation of the um, transverse sinus and the tentorium um, that also um, uh, kind of unify the, 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 the what you see. And, and there's an upward push of the what, what's remaining of the cerebellar vermis uh, from that large fourth ventricular uh, cystic dilatation um, that uh, make up the, um, uh, the full spectrum of, of phenotypes. Um, because there is a, um, a issue with the fourth ventricle, um, you get hydrocephalus that develops usually after birth. Uh, that is also part of the um, um, constellation of findings. So Blake's pouch cyst is a kind of, a, a, again, whether these are related is still contested, but I, I like to group them together. Um, here you have, again, um, a fourth ventricular cyst that expands in the posterior in the posterior fossa and causes hydrocephalus, um, and it's thought to be a failed rupture of the um, of the Blake's pouch, um, which is a precursor of the um, foramen of Magendi uh, around the fourth uh, month. Unlike uh, Dandy Walker malformation, there's no significant vermeal degeneration or posterior fossa expansion. And, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why uh, it may be considered uh, a separate disorder. Um, um, and so um, just something to keep in mind of how to differentiate those two. And then there is a third uh, disease that uh, is often talked about along this uh, complex called mega cisterna magna. Uh, the cisterna magna is that large collection of CSF behind the uh, and inferior to the cerebellum, um, and in some cases it can be enlarged, um, uh, but um, uh, there's there's no cyst, um, at least um, um, at diagnosis, and there's no cerebellar uh, agenesis. And because there's no fourth ventricular cyst, there does seem to be um, uh, an, an ability of the, um, of the CSF to be free flowing into the cisterna magna and be reabsorbed, uh, and so uh, there's no hydrocephalus. And, and, and because of this, um, at least conceptually, it's thought to be a delayed rupture of Blake's pouch. Again, controversial, uh, but I think the um, it's, a, it's a nice way to think about it. 
uh, where you had a Blake's pouch, but perhaps uh, it ruptured. And, and so the, 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 um, um, what you see uh, pathologically is much less severe, uh, but could, could, could lie on a, uh, on a continuum. Um, again, whether these are a spectrum or different disorders is highly debated. Um, so we'll talk about this more in the, um, in the embryological um, component, but um, you have this, um, uh, during development, you have this um, posterior portion of the kind of um, um, brainstem um, uh, neural tube called the area membrane anterior um, and posterior uh, membrane area. Um, and um, a couple structures form here. You have this, the cord plexus, which is labeled here as CP. You have the... Uh, um, anterior and posterior components, um, membranous area. The anterior component is going, the rhombic lip, we'll see that in other lectures, is what's going to form the cerebellum. Um, and then and then from, from the posterior membranous area, you get this invagination, which is basically Blake's pouch. And this will eventually rupture um, during normal development and form the foramen of Magendi, which allows the CSF to flow through the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, the fourth ventricle, and outside into the cisterna magna before it gets reabsorbed in the um, um, the uh, sagittal sinuses. So um, if this doesn't rupture, then there is a non-communicating hydrocephalus that uh, presumably forms. Um, and, and I guess in one theory, um, expansion of that Blake's pouch is going to lead to that large cystic dilatation. So, um, you know, I think that's really the uh, um, conceptual way to think about this is that you have these, uh, this ventricular system where it communicates with the cisterna magna um, and, 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 and to, to, to have that communication, there really needs to be a rupture of, of the, um, that um, membranous area um, around the fourth ventricle to uh, flow, uh, to help the CSF flow into the cisterna magna. If this does not um, break apart, um, then, then, then uh, the CSF can build up in the ventricular system and form these large uh, cystic structures. And again, I can't emphasize how much this is um, controversial um, because um, other theories, um, um, although original theories um, considered um, um, Dandy Walker malformation to be this lack of foramen of Magendi, there are some cases where you have a Dandy Walker malformation with pot with patent um, um, uh, foramen, uh, um, and so it's not in all cases where there is um, a lack of um, uh, communication between the cisterna magna and the fourth ventricle. Um, um, and some and, 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 and some new theories emphasize the um, um, the vermeil um, uh, hypoplasia as the key as the key factor, but um, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, if you want to think about them I, I, um, in a kind of way that's easy to remember, I do think the spectrum is helpful. So here you have um, a normal cerebellum. You have your cerebellum, your choroid plexus, and you have your cisterna magna here. In the retro uh, retro uh, retro cerebellar space, in a mega cisterna magna, um, where you have a rupture that connects the fourth ventricle to the cisterna magna, um, you, presumably it does affect development uh, to some degree. So you do have a, a kind of a larger cisterna magna. Um, the cyst involutes because of the rupture, um, and there's no cere cerebellar hypoplasia. Um, because it ruptured it um, early enough where the cerebellum can form uh, normally. These patients are usually asymptomatic, is a benign disorder um, uh, uh, once, once, once the, uh, the baby is born without any other defects. Um, um, so Blake's pouch, uh, really, you have this failure of rupture of Blake's pouch. Um, you have an enlarged... Um, retro uh, cerebellar space. There is a large cyst that's lined by uh, the, the the same layers as the uh, fourth ventricle. So you have an ependymal layer, 
Um, you you may have some cerebellar aspects of the cyst um, uh, closer to the cerebellar tissue, but importantly, uh, perhaps due to the smaller size um, compared to Dandy Walker malformation, you do not have that um, cerebellar hypoplasia. And then Dandy Walker malformation is the most severe uh, form where again, you do have this fourth ventricle lined uh, cyst um, that is continuous with the fourth ventricle. You have a massively enlarged uh, retro uh, cerebellar space and you have hypoplasia of the cerebellar vermis. Um, new theories suggest that um, the genes that are implicated in familial forms of Dandy Walker malformations are involved in cilia. Uh, and perhaps migration. And so the um, cerebellar hypoplasia, whereas can be considered kind of um, being disrupted by the actual cyst. Some of the newer theories uh, suggest that it's the actual genes um, that are affecting uh, its proper development. There is um, a separate disorder called um, cerebellar vermeal hypoplasia uh, that's now included in the complex. Um, where you have um, a fairly normal or prominent retro uh, cerebellar space. You do not have that cyst wall, um, uh, but you have a cerebellar hypoplasia. And I think why it's been brought in is because of these kind of alternative theories uh, that Dandy Walker malformation may actually affect um, the cerebellar uh, vermis formation as a primary uh, driver rather than a secondary cause of the cyst. So, um, Perhaps even including that will help you remember these different disorders. Demographics, very rare disorder, usually uh, diagnosed within the first year of life. Uh, but some of these, um, uh, depending on the size, can be asymptomatic, especially if there's no hydrocephalus um, and maybe diagnosed later. Usually equal in males and females. And risk factors, as we'll see, is very complicated. There can be some genetic ones, but also some teratogens. Uh, some infections that may uh, cause secondary damage to the meninges um, and block uh, these foramina. So that's why perhaps you may even have a patent foramina that are normally developed. But if you have some sort of um, migrational disorder, such as Walker Warburg or um, uh, infection that leads to fibrosis of the um, um, uh, uh, um, leptomeninges, you may not be able to reabsorb the um, uh, the, um, um, the cerebral spinal fluid, and and you may get a, a, a cyst formation, irrespective of of how the these foramina develop. So, um, uh, kind of a multifactorial disorder, to say the least. Again, embryologically, um, one of the initial theories was proposed failure of foramen of Magendi and Lushka to become fully patent. Um, the cerebellum usually develops uh, from the rhombomeres, um, which are uh, kind of uh, pattern structures uh, around the area of the um, of the brainstem, uh, third to fourth week. Uh, there's an expansion of the midline of these uh, rhombic lips to form the vermis around the third month. Chorid plexus, as we saw, forms in this kind of um, posterior membranous area. Uh, membranous area um, and the telecordia uh, um, and uh, basically um, the frame of magendi forms to connect the fourth ventricle and the subarachnoid space uh, in that kind of inferior or posterior component of the um, a membranous area uh, um, by rupturing and it does if that doesn't happen um then, then you can have problems. Um, usually, um, uh, the anterior one becomes uh, disappears and come, becomes incorporated into the chord plexus um, uh, during vermis formation. Uh, but if it's thickened or it interferes with um, the uh, um, the rupturing of Blake's pouch, uh, that could be also um, a cause uh, for um, uh, the cyst formation. Uh, so it's sporadic, uh, but there are, again, genetic disorders that are being implicated in this um, with the new ones being what are called ciliopathies um, 
that affect cilia formation. So there may be some migrational uh, component to it uh, that may also account for that um, cerebellar hypoplasia. That's such an important part of the diagnosis. So um, again, clinical features, the vermis is small and usually upward rotated, as we see here. Um, you have this fourth ventricular cyst that's that communicates with the fourth ventricle. Um, because the cyst is large, it pushes or or, or splays the um, cerebellar hemispheres laterally. Um, and then you have um, upward displacement of the tentorium, uh, the torcula, um, the sagittal sinus, um, because of this kind of large cystic space. So, um, you know, the same features that you see on imaging are what you're going to see pathologically. Uh, because this is a non-communicating uh, hydrocephalus uh, or non-communicating, uh, there's no way for the CSF to be reabsorbed. You have non-communicating hydrocephalus, usually occurs at birth or during um, infancy, and the macrocephaly can affect, um, it's going to be driving a lot of the symptoms. So uh, poor, poor motor control, seizures, 50% um, of patients have uh, significant intellectual disability, uh, although some patients are reported to have uh, fairly normal um, uh, cognitive function. This may be because of this spectrum and and and, and kind of overcalling Dandy Walker malformation um, with uh, other variants, um, but um, the mega cisterna magna uh, usually is benign and asymptomatic. So it may be something you see incidentally on imaging. Uh, again, you know, it's self-explanatory based on the definitions, what you see on imaging. Um, uh, but interestingly, uh, when you do catch it on image uh, on uh, in fetuses, um, we don't know how these will progress. Sometimes the cyst does involute, uh, such as in mega sister and magna. Sometimes it doesn't grow, and but sometimes it can grow very quickly. So uh, just because you detect it, um, we just don't know how um, it's going to. Um, progress and the kind of high frequency of terminations in these cases uh, also precludes us from from understanding uh, this the ultrasound um, has poor sensitivity and specificity mostly because it's very difficult to see the connections with the fourth ventricle and the cyst lining so mri is recommended when it's suspected um, uh, so just uh, something else to keep in mind so pathology um we see a nice picture here from the back where we see that cerebellum with the splaying of the cerebellar hemispheres and that large fourth ventricular cyst. And when um, this specimen uh, was um, um, uh, taken underwater, so you can see the cyst lining kind of floating around, a uh, very beautiful picture. And microscopically, uh, we see that there is um, this trilaminar structure with um, uh, ependymal layers, neuroglial tissue and even some meninges on the outside. Uh, so um, um, very different from uh, some of the mimics like an arachnoid cyst, uh, for example, that may be formed and really highlights that this is a fourth ventricular cyst uh, because of the uh, constituents. So again, grossly cystic dilatation with direct communication with the fourth ventricle. Cysts are usually fragmented during dissection because of their delicateness. So you need to take good care um, make sure these patients have good rheological imaging, um, uh, do some of the dissection um, in water to help preserve the cyst. Um, and if it's fragmented, you can also uh, put it underwater to help uh, document the, the, um, the, the images. The hypoplasia of the cerebellum, um, especially the vermis, is what really is going to help you determine if this is a Dandy Walker malformation in the true sense, or if it's one of these variants Um like the uh, mega sister and magna or the Blake's pouches, which have a, a, a lesser degree of uh, vermeal um, hypoplasia. The vermis is rotated rostrally um, uh, under the along the surface of the tentorium. Microscopically, the cyst is going to be uh, really important here. Uh, you want to see that um, there is tough of choroid plexus, there's cerebellar tissue, there's ependema. Uh, that support its 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 identity as a fourth ventricular cyst. Um, 
and uh, similar to the Chiari, uh, you want to look for other malformations as um, as this can be part of a, a constellation of findings uh, of, uh, of, syn of syndromes, such as polymicrogyria, microgyria, heterotopias. Um, and this would suggest more of a genetic uh, predisposition rather than an environmental one, such as uh, an infection or, uh, or a thickened uh, leptomeninges from some insult. So uh, here's some more pictures, um, just highlighting the upward uh, displacement of the vermis and the uh, cyst wall, uh, which in some areas is um, uh, contains the, the vermeal tissue and in other areas is much more thin and may contain just the fourth ventricular components. Just some more examples of that cyst. Um, uh, beautiful pictures here, um, that cyst. Uh, formation in the in the in the posterior fossa. You have an H and E image in panel C showing that uh, disorganized, immature uh, tissue um, uh, and cerebellar tissue that line the the cystic cavity, and these sagittal sections um, uh, just show potentially some uh, variations with um, a much more hypoplastic uh, vermis in panel E than panel F. Um, um, with E maybe being a, a higher chance uh, being one of these severe Dandy Walker malformations, whereas the smaller cyst uh, with the um, preserved vermis um, may suggest a variant uh, such as a Blake Bouch cyst um, in panel F. Differential, again, um, it's important to um, differentiate these from other conditions, uh, uh, specifically um, in the posterior fossa, arachnoid cysts. Arachnoid cysts um, are, are cysts. Again, they have the same uh, collection, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, but these are formed by the arachnoid cells. So the, the lining is going to be much different. It's going to have a slender arachnoid cell uh, a cyst wall microscopically. These are usually uh, flattened because of the pressure and are usually found above the cerebellum rather than below. So their location documenting that is also going to help you differentiate these two. And other cysts that may uh, develop in the posterior fossa, uh, tumors, um, pilocytics, ependymal cysts. So um, uh, getting that trilaminar um, uh, um, uh, um, cyst wall with the ependyma, the disorganized cerebellar tissue um, is going to help you differentiate it from other kind of uh, diagnostic mimics. Um, hypoplastic cerebellums without cyst formation can also um, masquerade uh, as a Dandy Walker malformation, Joubert syndrome, which we'll talk about in another lecture, Walker-Warburg uh, syndrome, where uh, cerebellar hypoplasia is part of the um, um, uh, diagnosis. Um, just briefly, uh, Joubert syndrome, this is an autosomal recessive syndrome. So again, the key here is that uh, while these are rare and likely um, may, may, may uh, be easy to uh, uh, differentiate, uh, it has uh, significant implications if something is autosomal recessive versus sporadic for family planning. So uh, getting this right is of utmost importance for the family um, yeah, in these difficult uh, situations. Um, these, uh, the, um, Joubert also has a genesis of the vermis, um, but, uh, also has prominent, uh, um, midbrain abnormalities, which are not found in Dandy Walker malformations and suggest a kind of different neurodevelopmental, uh, trajectory, right? It's a, it's a defect in, in rhombomere, um, 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 and, 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 and the brain tissue more specifically than the, um, um, than perhaps some of the other um, concepts that we talked about today. Um, and um, because of the, um, um, there's this thickening of the cerebellar peduncles and the uh, the cerebellar peduncles um, push outward, uh, you get this kind of characteristic molar tooth sign on axial imaging, which are shown here on the um, on the right side that are kind of easy to help you uh, uh, begin with that working diagnosis. Um, um, 
right off the bat. Uh, there's no cyst in this as well. Um, and there's a good communication between the fourth ventricle and the uh, subarachnoid space in the cisterna magna. So um, uh, very distinct uh, features um, anatomically as well. Um, they also have distinct clinical features. So um, even the, 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 the neurologist, the pediatric neurologist will be able to um, help uh, differentiate these two um, with episodic um, um, apne apneic episodes, abnormal eye movements, and mental retardation uh, being key features of Joubert syndrome. The pathogenesis is multifactorial. We'll get to that in a second. Um, again, originally thought to be an occlusion of the foramen of Magendi and Lushka uh, that connect the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. Uh, but some cases do, uh, in fact, um, uh, show patent um, uh, uh, frame in us, so it may not be the, the full story. Um, and the kind of new emerging theme is these ciliopathies or um, um, defects in, in, in genes involved in cilia and cerebellar formation, so um, um, something to consider. 75% do have non-communicating hydrocephalus. So there, there does seem to be some um, occlusion of the of these of these um, foramen, whether it be as a primary or secondary defect, um, and, and still just not well understood. And I think this this figure here um, really just shows um, um, that um, the, the difficulty in nailing down a pathogenesis may be because of the multifactorial aspect of this disease. So we have some genetic uh, contributions that may primarily lead to cerebellar hypoplasia um, and, a, and atresia of the um, foramina. Um, this may be much more prominent in um, disorders that lead to hyperplasia of the meninges or teratogens that may affect um, uh, how these develop. And then, of course, uh, infections and other hemorrhagic processes that may also occlude the foramina that normally would have formed. Um, when these occur, may determine what variant of the disease you have. Um, so if they occur very early, you may have a Dandy Walker malformation. If they occur later, maybe you have a Blake's pouch cyst uh, without the vermeal de uh, degeneration. And if they somehow um, are... Um, uh, can be perforated early on, um, you, you you may get uh, mega cisterna magna or a much less severe form. Um, and then, of course, um, I think the importance here of, of, of this being included um, is that perhaps some of these genes um, and cis formation may affect uh, uh, how the vermis develops. Um, normally, it is that last part of the cerebellum that forms. And so... Um, there's a long window for it to be disrupted uh, in development. So perhaps um, there is some um, uh, good reasons to include as part of the spectrum. Um, so very controversial topic, but hopefully um, it, this provides a framework of how to think about these disorders. Um, you know, on exams, I would mention that um, the, the pathoph pathophysiology is controversial and maybe mention some of the theories and why uh, they don't all fit um, um, perfectly into a very neat um, mechanistic um, understanding of this disease. Uh, but perhaps there isn't a neat a mechanistic understanding. Perhaps it is a multifactorial disorder and, 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 and some mechanisms may be at play in some, some patients uh, and not others. So lots to um, uh, still uh, be... Um, sorted out in, in, in future iterations of, of research in these topics. So hopefully that was helpful. Stay tuned for more. Thanks for listening.